Don't worry about what other people think. Don't try to get their point of view. Just try to tell other people and have them understand where you are coming from. Hello, Architect Nation. My name is Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architectural practice. Today is a special episode where I'm going to share with you some content from behind the scenes here at Business of Architecture. We're going to talk about seven habits of highly ineffective people. Now, obviously, this is a play on the very popular business book by Stephen R. Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. We're going to be taking the converse side, which is if you want to be completely ineffective as a leader, if you want to be completely ineffective in your role as an architecture firm owner, if you want to have no free time, if you want to be a slave to your firm, then here's the roadmap for how to do this. And of course, on the flip side, just do the opposite and you'll be pretty well off. Now, these tips come directly from my own personal experience, both leading and making many and many of these mistakes. As a matter of fact, it's not uncommon to see young leaders or even older leaders who maybe have some of these bad habits ingrained. Perhaps you've seen them at firms that you've been a part of, or perhaps as you listen to this episode, you'll be thinking, yeah, that's that's kind of me. I do that all the time. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that was addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently, saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near-native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement, and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. Ineffective habit number one. So our ineffective habit number one is in your architectural practice, be reactive. What does it mean to be reactive? Me, to be reactive means that we're constantly reacting to situations that arise instead of being proactive to the things that come up for us. One example would be business development. So the beauty of running an architectural practice is if you do good work over time, eventually you're going to get more and more of that same kind of work. Now, having a referral-based business is the creme de la creme. It is the, the golden ticket to becoming a free architect. And yet at the same time, this freedom can also be a bit of a prison because when we put the business development on autopilot, when we just react to the inquiries coming in, as opposed to actually taking a proactive strategy, what ends up happening is our past ends up determining our future. You'll get more of the same kind of projects. You'll get more of the same kind of clients. You'll be working with more of the same kind of profit margins and the cycle will repeat itself again and again and again. This is just one example. There's a lot of different ways in an architectural practice that we could look at this idea of being reactive versus proactive. Now to illustrate, I'm going to tell you a quick story that happened to me when I was literally the first week of school at Cornell University. So Cornell University is located upstate New York and I was Coming from California, I kind of had the surfer vibe going on. And my sole intent in going across the country was number one, to go to a top architecture school, and number two, to be someplace far, far away from California. I had a home situation at home that I wanted to get away from. And so for me, getting accepted to Cornell was the perfect opportunity to stretch and spread my wings. 
Now, the story I'm going to tell, like I said, it happened on the first week of school, and I was going into the student union. And there in the student union at Cornell, they had a number of tables set up where they had students who were playing chess. And I thought this was cool. I've always been a bit of an amateur chess player. I've always liked playing it. I liked playing it with my brother when I grew up. As a matter of fact, when I lived in Honduras, I met a guy who was pretty decent at chess, and he started to teach me a little bit of the intricacies of chess. Now, having said that, I am a terrible chess player. I can, you know, I could probably beat a beginner, but above that, I can probably see maybe two, maybe three moves in advance. So if you're an, an advanced or, or inter, even an intermediate chess player, you may completely laugh at this story. I, hopefully you'll get a kick out of this regardless. So here's what happened. As I'm walking in and I look over to the side and I see these people playing chess, I think, wow, I love playing chess. Let's do this. So I sit down at the chess table across from another student and he holds up his fist to me like this. And if you're listening to the podcast and you can't see me, I have both of my fists that are closed and it's held out across from me. Now, traditionally, and I did not even know this, traditionally, this is the way that you would start a chess match because in one hand is going to be the black pawn and in the other hand will be uh, a white pawn or the king or whatever. I don't even know. But this is how you determine who's going to be white and who's going to be black. Now, at the time, I didn't even realize this. So as he sat there with his fists in front of me, I had no idea what he was doing. I like literally no idea what was happening. And embarrassingly enough, I, I thought he wanted a fist bump. <laughs> So I gave him a fist bump. <laughs> Even now, thinking back, I think Enoch, oh, what an idiot. Um, that should have been his first sign that this is going to be a very short game, and it should have been my first sign that I had no clue what I had gotten myself into. I'd never been part of a chess club. I'd never been part of a chess team. And so I had no understanding of chess as a formal game and the strategies that went along with it. Now, fortunately, he, he barged on, he continued on, he said, well, pick, pick a hand. And so sheepishly, I picked a hand and then he revealed the black, the black chess piece. So great. He was leading out. He started. And of course there was a timer. This was a time game. So every time he moved a chess piece, he would hit the timer and then I would move a chess piece and hit the timer. Now by the third or fourth move, I was completely out of my element. I was already mixed up. I was losing. And what ended up happening during this game is I was just reacting to the pieces that he was putting forward. Now, if you know anything about chess, this is a position that you don't want to get yourself in. If you've gotten yourself into a reactive position, in other words, if you're reacting in your chess moves to what the other person is doing, you have lost all advantage in the game. The only hope for you is that the other person makes a fatal mistake. Because when they're leading out, they're taking the leadership position. This means that they're guiding the game and you're just reacting to it. So in terms of your architectural practice, imagine that life and business and money and leading team members and winning clients, pretend like this is all a gigantic and very complex chess game. Now, if you're out there just reacting to the things that happen, you have already lost the game. And when I say lost the game, it may not be catastrophic. It just means that you're playing a mediocre game. It means that there's a huge potential that you're leaving untapped because you're just reacting to the things that are happening in front of you. If you want to take real leadership in your firm, if you want to be able to chart your future, then you must get out of the reactive pit that so many of us are in when we're in business because it's the easiest thing to do and we don't know anything different. As a side note, this is why something like smart practice that we teach here at Business of Architecture is so important because it gives you a framework for being proactive. One of the challenges that you may have as a firm owner is thinking, well, Enoch, I understand the idea of being proactive, but what exactly do I need to be proactive about? What are the things that I need to do? In what sequence do I need to do them? These are all questions that are answered by smart practice. So if the path here forward for you is to stop being reactive and start being proactive, and if you find a framework or something like smart practice to be able to implement your practice even better, if not, you'll need to invent and come up with your own proactive system yourself, but that is the key having a proactive way to move forward. The second habit of being a highly ineffective person is to have no clear vision for the future. There's this great line in Alice in Wonderland where Alice is trying to find her way back home and she comes to a fork in the road and there's the Cheshire cat, that devious and clever smiling phantasm. And the Cheshire cat looks at her and as she's looking up at this cat, she asks the cat, which way do I need to go? You know, which, which of these two roads should I take? And the Cheshire cat says a famous and immortal line that I'm going to paraphrase. 
But basically, he asks Alice, do you know where you want to go? And Alice says that she doesn't. And then the Cheshire cat so brilliantly says, well, then it doesn't matter, does it? Having a clear vision of where you want to get to is so extremely important. In Stephen R. Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he mentions the idea of beginning with the end in mind. That means that we have a clear picture of what we're looking to create. Now, this doesn't negate the idea of an emergent strategy. And as a matter of fact, that's an entirely separate conversation. But what we can say is that if you're looking to fly a plane to a destination and you don't know where it is that you want to go, then you're going to have little to no say about where you actually end up. A lot of times as we make goals, it's frustrating sometimes to make goals. And we think, why should I even make goals? Because I never hit them anyways. Well, this is a false perception and a myth about how goals actually help us. Because ultimately, like a famous um, boxer, Mike Tyson once said, he said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And what he basically means is that planning is essential, but plans are worthless. It's the actual process of creating that vision that gives you the direction of where you want to go. Now, today in today's world, many small architectural practice owners, they have no idea about where they want to go. They just don't know. They have more questions than they have answers. And as a matter of fact, they are hoping that their life in the future will be better, that someday they'll start making a profit, that someday they'll start getting the better clients. And they're putting all of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their aspirations on the luck of the wind. So in summary, habit number two of highly ineffective people is to have no clear vision for the future. Habit number three of highly ineffective people is to always focus on low priority tasks. Let's face it, in a given day, there's a lot of things that you could be working on and not all tasks are created equal. So if you want to stay on the hamster wheel, a great way to do this is just to focus on the low priority tasks, you know, organizing your email, cleaning your desk, vacuuming out the office, doing things that don't have a high return on investment, maybe doing your bookkeeping, categorizing transactions. A lot of these things are very low level tasks. Now, one of the challenges as business owners is when we start out, we have to do everything ourselves. And so it's natural to keep that mentality and keep that initial, uh, just that energy. Because as a firm owner, if you currently run a practice and you start it out from scratch, it's likely that you're a go-getter, you're a self-starter, you're someone that, that takes the bull by the horns, so to speak. And so while this is good in the early stages of a firm, maybe the first six months or so, as quickly as possible, you need to be able to start focusing on things that are higher leverage, which means that we're delegating, we're getting things off of our plate, we're outsourcing. So when we look at number here, number three, our third habit of highly ineffective people is to do low priority tasks. In other words, just chase fires all day. Show up, see what's in your inbox, you know, maybe browse social media for a little bit, jump into your inbox, and then start working on other people's priorities for your day. One of my mentors once told me a brilliant statement. I don't know if he came up with it or someone else. I think it may have come from David Allen, who's the productivity expert. But he said, your email inbox is someone else's agenda for your day. Let that sit with you for a minute. Your email inbox is someone else's agenda for your day. Recently, I was hanging out with my brother-in-law. He is a sales professional in the technology world. He works for a cryptocurrency company. And his job as a sales professional is to work on strategy, but at the same time, he's also in charge of managing his team and pushing deals forward. So his daily activities look like a lot of text messages, a lot of emails. He's constantly reacting to different things that come into his inbox, but that's part of his role. That's necessary. In a sales function, it's a lot of times it is very reactive because you're reacting to leads, you're following up with people. So for instance, in an architectural context, this would mean that when you get those inquiries in, you want to be able to respond to those people as quickly as possible. You don't want to leave them waiting. The early bird gets the worm. You want to engage them in conversation. You want to book the meeting. After you have the meeting, you want to be able to move them to the proposal stage as quickly as possible, as long as you're going through the proper steps to understand their needs, that their wants, the the project parameters, and then be able to come to a decision point that this is either a fit or it's not a fit. So all of these things require following up and being proactive. Now, one of the challenges of running a practice and being 
the sole person who's in your practice or maybe the leader of a small team is that there's going to be a lot of things that you don't necessarily have support and help doing. And so the natural default tendency a lot of times is for us to take these things on ourselves, for us to constantly be doing these low-level tasks that we should get off of our plate. Now, of course, this is easier said than done because if we have a pattern and a habit and we've basically trained our brain to know that doing everything is the way to succeed, then it's going to be very difficult to move into more of a leadership position in the firm. And this is why we say that as a firm grows, there's different stages of growth. And these go by the zeros, the tens, and the 300s. And if we cross out the zeros, it would just be by multiples of 10 and 300. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that as you grow as a firm owner, you're going to find that at the first juncture of a startup, kind of your $100,000 a year in revenue is your first goal. So anywhere from 100 to you know to about 300,000, that's about what you as a practitioner are going to be able to produce by yourself. Now to get past 300,000, which is our first multiple of 3, this is where you need to suddenly have a different operating system the way you operate your practice. It's going to include hiring someone, you're going to have to change the way that you approach the practice. The same thing happens at a million dollars. The same thing happens. So we go, we go 100,000, 300,000, a million, and then 3 million, and 10 million, and 30 million, et cetera. So we can see that most small architectural practices are going to be between the zero and the 10 million mark, which means that when you hit that 100,000, you're looking at a new way of operating the practice. When you hit the 300,000, you're going to have to look at a new way to operate the practice to be able to give yourself more free time, more freedom, more creative direction. The same thing's going to happen at the million dollar mark. Now, the problem is, is if you're always chasing fires, if you're always just showing up in the office and just responding to what's in your inbox and you're focusing on low priority tasks, then you're never going to be able to move past those critical junctures and milestones. So in summary, again, habit number three of highly ineffective people is to Always work on the low priority tasks. And the principle here is not all tasks are created equal. And the path here is for you to identify and focus on the high leverage activities, the high priority activities that actually bring you closer and move you forward to becoming the free architect. Habit number four of highly ineffective people is to think, lose, win, or win, lose. Now, Stephen Covey in his groundbreaking book talked about the idea of win, win that this is what we want to go for in a business relationship. And of course, we know that a lot of times in business, there are other people out there, they're looking for a win-lose situation. In other words, they want to win and they want to make you lose. The part that we often don't talk about that happens a lot in architecture is what I call a lose-win situation. So if you want to be highly ineffective, always set up all of your deals to be a lose-win, meaning that you lose and the other party wins. What do I mean? Oftentimes, Architectural practitioners will work themselves to the bone. They'll overwork themselves. They'll work extra hours. They'll not pay themselves. They'll pay their team members and their staff members first. They will not charge as much or they will discount their fees. They'll compete based upon price. This is what I call a lose win situation. You lose. You give away a vast amount of value to your clients. You don't capture that value. They give you money. They get incredibly more value than what, than what you have given them, which is fantastic. But the problem is, is that you're the one who loses. Now, the problem and the challenge with this is you can only lose so much before you start to resent it, before you start to get disillusioned, before it starts to seem like the world and the architecture industry is stacked against you, before you buy into the myth that architects aren't supposed to be wealthy, that architects can never be free, that the whole role of an architect is to work. And the only way to be able to do the creative work you love is to sacrifice your health, your well-being, and your financial abundance. So in summary, habit number four of highly ineffective people is to think, lose, win. Discount your fees, put in extra time, don't charge your clients for scope creep, try to hire the cheapest team members possible. All of these things are a losing strategy for you. Habit number five of highly ineffective people is to seek first to be understood. What do I mean? One of the most challenging things about running a small architectural practice is capturing the value of your services. Now, here's the really interesting paradigm. If you were to look back at all the architectural and design work that you've done, and you were to look at the value that was delivered to your clients, I am 100% positive 
that you would find that the value delivered to your clients far exceeds the value that you got from that transaction, and that's as it should be. I always say that in a business transaction, you should look to give the other party 10 times more value than you receive. Now, the beautiful thing that allows commerce to actually happen is if someone values what you have more than they value what they're giving you. So in an exchange for architectural services, the ideal situation is that someone is going to value your architectural services, your design, your oversight, your creativity more than they value the money sitting in their bank account. And from your perspective, what you value more than keeping all the drawings and keeping all your design talent to yourself is actually getting money in your bank account, being able to get certain products built, being able to build your portfolio, being able to see your creative work brought to fruition, which is a huge amount of value that your clients are giving you. Now, the challenge comes when as an architectural professional, you're dealing with this challenge of feeling like clients don't understand your value and you're trying to get them to see their value. So you can fall into this trap of seeking to be understood. When I've audited a lot of architectural practices, almost 99% of architectural practices and the way they present their services and their scope and what they do and their creative services, what we generally find, especially for small architectural practices, is that they're seeking to be understood. In other words, hey, here's what we do. Hey, here's how we do it. Here's why we're better. Here's all the wonderful things that come along with working with us. This is why you should choose us. Now, this strategy is going to get you so far. You can certainly close a large amount of contracts using that kind of sales strategy. But what we find is you can amplify and you're leaving tons of money on the, on the table. But more importantly, you're leaving tons of architectural opportunity on the table if you don't first seek to understand. A quick anecdote from my own life. One thing that's been challenging being a married man is following this in my personal life because let's face it, I always want my wife to understand my point of view. I want to be understood. I want her to validate my feelings. I want her to understand what I'm thinking and I want to show her that my way is the right way. If you have a long-term partner, even a short-term partner, you probably know what I'm talking about. Now, as much as I know that this is a losing strategy, oftentimes I find myself falling back into this old pattern of trying to convince my wife why my way is better or having her understand my point of view. And of course, it should go without saying that this strategy is ineffective, but what is effective is when I first seek to understand where my wife is coming from, when I validate her experience of the world, and then I'm able to, I'm able to repeat that back to her in a way that she understands, then she'll be open to understanding my point of view. So if we were to summarize habit number five of highly ineffective people, it is to seek first to be understood. Don't worry about what other people think. Don't try to get their point of view. Just try to tell other people and have them understand where you are coming from. Habit number six of highly ineffective people is to be siloed. What do I mean? Well, a silo is a contained area of space. So we can think about grain silos or these gigantic cylindrical buildings where they put grain in. And a lot of times what we see in organizations is we see silos happening. Now, you know that silos are not good. But as architects, it's very tempting to be siloed. In other words, we want to we work on our creative juices and create our design before we unveil it to the world or a colleague or someone else. So oftentimes what can happen is in organizations, small firms, we can be working by ourselves. We can be isolating ourselves from other team members, maybe even not collaborating as much as we could with the consultants like our electrical engineers, our structural engineers, or maybe just bringing them in at the end. As a matter of fact, we see this happen a lot in architecture where the architectural practice, the firm will go through a large design project and get very, very far down the, down the project before bringing in a design build contract or a contractor to review the pricing, finding out that the pricing is much more than the client had budgeted for the project. And now everyone is in a difficult situation, feeling upset, and the expectations have not been managed. The opposite of being siloed is working in synergy, synergistically. And a good example of this is the way that the post-it notes were created. So when post-it notes were created, they were, they were created in the 1960s by a gentleman named Dr. Spencer Silver, who worked at 3M, which is, of course, a very large chemical company that produces a lot of chemical products and consumer products and commercial products. Well, he was trying to discover a formula for a, a glue that held a fastener for airline applications. And uh, what he came up with instead was this this adhesive that 
kind of had this tacky substance to it. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't until several years later that a gentleman by the name of Art Fry was singing with his church choir and suddenly realized that this adhesive would be a great way to bookmark his hymnal, as the story goes, without damaging his book. Now, thus, the post-it note was invented, and now we have post-it notes are probably the most widely used piece of paper other than the pieces of paper that you print out of your printer at work. So we have post-it notes everywhere. We use them. They're a common parlance. They even have a name for them, the post-it note. Now, the only reason that this was able to happen is because there was a cross-pollination of knowledge. There was a synergy that was happening as opposed to a siloing effect. So in other words, this engineer, this person, Art Fry, who knew of this invention, was working and actually wasn't even working. He was off of work and he was in his church singing a hymn. And it was these intersection of these two experiences that allowed the post-it notes to happen. So consider in your practice, in your architectural practice, that when we silo ourselves, this is a way to have a very, very ineffective habit. Don't communicate with your clients. Don't communicate with your consultants. Try to do as much as you can without asking other people for help. This is what it means to be siloed, and it's a sure recipe for having an ineffective habit. The seventh habit of highly ineffective people is to keep chopping, 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 chopping. What do I mean by that? Imagine that you're chopping down a tree for firewood and you have this ax and you just keep on, you've been using this ax for years and years. You've been using it so long, as a matter of fact, that the ax is absolutely dull. Frankly, this is a problem that happens oftentimes in my house because no one in our house sharpens the knives except for myself. And so what we end up happening, a couple months pass, and then before you know it, I go to cut a bell pepper and the bell pepper collapses under my knife instead of being cut very smoothly. So how does this principle apply to your success as an effective person or the lack of your success as an ineffective person. In his book, Stephen R. Covey talks about sharpening the saw. And he gives the parable. He said, look, if I had five hours to cut down a tree, I would spend an hour sharpening the saw. That would make my work much faster instead of just trying to hit the saw with a dull blade. Now, this is a powerful, powerful principle. And if you consider that you are the saw in this example. You are the X. If you don't invest in your own growth, if you don't invest in your own expansion, if you don't invest in your mind, if you don't invest in your skill sets, if you don't invest in your mindset, if you don't invest in your discipline, it's like you're trying to cut down a tree with a dull ax. Yeah, you'll get there eventually, but it's going to take you a very, very, very long time to do it. So if you want to be an ineffective person, try to do everything yourself. Be DIY. Do your own website. Do your own marketing. Try to figure out your own business strategy. Never invest in yourself. Never invest in a mentor. Never invest in a coach. Never take any online classes or courses in business or how to improve your selling skills or your marketing skills in architecture for owner. Never invest in getting someone else to come in and help you solve the blind spots and the issues that you can't solve. So if we were to sum up ineffective habit number seven of highly ineffective people, it is to never invest in yourself Keep chopping, 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 doing things the way you have done them in the past and just hoping for things to get better. One of the primary telltale signs that I see of people who constantly feel like they're on the hamster wheel, constantly feel like they're stretched and overwhelmed, constantly are wondering why business isn't easier, why their architectural practice isn't more abundant, why they're dealing with the clients that they're dealing with now is because they've never actually invested in themselves. And I'm not talking about a a little course off of LinkedIn for $25 or maybe a book off of Amazon for $15 or an audible book for $7. No, I'm talking about spending serious money, money equivalent to your college tuition or more in yourself, honing and refining the most essential skills that you can have as an architecture firm owner, the skill of rainmaking, which is subdivided into the skill of being a hunter, being a marketer, being a closer. Do you want to remain on the hamster wheel? You want to sacrifice your health, your well-being, your financial abundance for the creative work that you do? Well, simply avoid investing in yourself. Never take any sales courses on learning how to sell. Never invest time and energy learning how to market. Never try to learn how to lead people in a powerful and effective way. This is the way that you can ensure that you will be ineffective compared to what you could potentially tap into on the flip side. So. The seventh habit of highly ineffective people is to just keep chopping, chopping, and chopping. And you know what? If that tree isn't falling down, just chop harder. So in summary, here are our seven habits of highly ineffective people. Habit number one, be reactive. 
How about number two, have no clear vision for the future. Just jump in and try to figure it out as you go. Number three, instead of working on things that are high priority, focus on the low priority task, the things that need to get done today and are very, very unimportant. Number four, think, lose, win. Always consider how can you give away more of your value as an architecture firm owner? How can you charge lesser fees? How can you hire more cheaply? How can you invest less money in yourself and in your practice? Think, lose, win. Habit number five of highly ineffective firm owners is seek first to be understood. Try to convince the clients about your incredible value. Teach them, wow them with your renderings and your technical knowledge and expertise. Spend very little or no time at all actually trying to understand their perspective or where they're coming from. As a matter of fact, you can use this strategy with your team as well. Just trying to get your team to understand what you want, where the business is headed, and never actually trying to understand what it is that your team members want. Habit number six of highly effective, ineffective people is to be siloed. Don't ask for help. Try to figure it out on your own. Don't look at cross-disciplinary solutions. Don't get other people to support you and to contribute to your ideas. Just try to do everything yourself. Try to be the archetypal architect who can do everything, wear all the hats, because you do it best. This is the definition of being siloed. And number seven, the seventh habit of highly ineffective people is, you know what, if the practice isn't getting better, if you're not finding that the projects are improving in profitability, if you're finding that the clients that you're working with, they're not appreciating your design to the level that you would like, if you're finding that your practice isn't living up to your expectations, if you find that you're putting in more effort and work and you're working so hard for what you feel is not a lot, well, The answer here for a highly ineffective person is just keep doing more of the same. Keep chopping, chopping, chopping with that that ax that you're currently using. Don't invest in yourself. Whatever you do, heaven forbid that you get help from a coach or a mentor or someone that can help you find a shorter proven way to get to your end result. Well, this is Enoch Sears reminding you Carpe Diem. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode with a little bit of uh, tongue in cheek, perhaps gotten a few chuckles out of it, but perhaps almost also a lighthearted chuckle for you know the things that we all do and uh, there may have been some probably more than one of these habits that you can see that you're doing yourself and if that's the case hey be gentle with yourself um you know the whole purpose of this episode was to be a bit tongue in cheek and to point out some areas that give you some reflection about patterns of ineffective architecture firm owners and also to point out that these patterns are actually very typical They're the way that we typically manage without training and without help and expertise. Now, if you'd like to get help implementing effective ways, if you want to get off the hamster wheel, if you want to stop dealing with giving your work away for free, not capturing your value, settling for projects that are far below the aspiration of what you want to achieve as an architect, well, you may be a fit for smart practice. I don't know because we haven't talked, but the question for you is, would it be worth a quick hello call? This is a 15-minute call where there's nothing for sale from my team side. It's simply an opportunity for us to have a chat with you, your practice, your aspirations, and to see if smart practice could be the thing that helps turn you permanently from someone that maybe have may have something in common with a couple of these ineffective habits to being a high-level, high-performing architecture firm owner who's getting more free time, getting paid well for it, and working on work that you enjoy. And that's a wrap. Hey, Enix Sears here, and I I have a request since you are a listener here of the Business of Architecture podcast. Ryan and I, we love putting this podcast together. We love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. And one thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast, simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together so architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness, whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here my my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following, heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, will give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know 
the username that you use to leave the review and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wished they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that's addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently, saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near-native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement, and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.